Uh, I'm going to talk about epilepsy surgery in children with a focus on kind of what's new, where the field is going, some of our developing technology. Next slide. So I have no disclosures. So before we get started, I want to first introduce uh, my whole team, which on the neurosurgery side of things consists of myself as well as five amazing partners, Dr. Samuel Browd, Richard Allen Bogan, uh, Jason Houtman, Amy Lee, and Jeff Ogeman. And in terms of surgical epilepsy, it's myself, Dr. Ogeman, and Dr. Houtman. Next slide, please. The bigger team, though, really is team epilepsy. Uh, and I hope I've included everyone's name here. I'm sure there are people I've left off. But what I really want to highlight is that epilepsy management and really surgical epilepsy is a team sport. So on the surgery side of things, as I mentioned, I work with Dr. Houtman and Dr. Ogeman, but we couldn't do what we do without our amazing team of neurologists, geneticists, neuropsychologists, neuroradiologists, pathologists, oncologists, not to mention all the people who also help with research, both basic science as well as translational and clinical trials. Next slide. So I'm gonna give kind of an overview talk today. Um, we'll review pediatric epilepsy surgery, again, with a little bit of a focus on what's new, how we're growing, expanding, advancing the field. Um, and again, building off of Dr. Monrad's talk, we'll spend a bit of time defining medically refractory epilepsy, then discuss the rationale for early surgical intervention, some of the various etiologies that we encounter in the pediatric population. We'll discuss basic surgical interventions and then really focus our time on surgical options uh, and circle back to patient outcomes because I think that's what it all kind of boils down to. So in terms of seizures, psychosocial outcomes, and developmental gains. Next slide. So I'm going to start with a recent patient of mine. This is patient DF. I could stand up here all day and talk about the things we do, um, but for me it's the patients that always make it worthwhile, the individual patients, their families. Um, so DF is currently a six-year-old boy, and he had actually already beat the odds once. He was born with leaf Meni syndrome and was diagnosed with a right lateral intraventricular choroid plexus carcinoma when he was just under two years of age. And you can see his original scan in the picture on the left. He underwent multiple surgeries, chemo, radiation, and he survived. But at around age four, he began having seizures. These were initially controlled on medications, but by the spring of 2021, he was having daily seizures, despite being on multiple medications and having failed other medications, largely due to side effects, which either consisted of worsened left-sided weakness or worsened behavior. So we're gonna circle back to DF. Next slide, please. So uh, hopefully not repeating too much, we'll start with some basic definitions. So what is epilepsy? Uh, as Dr. Monra talked about, epilepsy refers to recurrent unprovoked seizures. So again, this doesn't include things like febrile seizures or a single post-traumatic seizure. But of note, after a single unprovoked seizure, the risk of another seizure is up to 50%. And after two unprovoked seizures, the chance by four years of having another is almost 75%. So medically refractory epilepsy refers to seizures that persist despite adequate trials of two appropriately chosen and used anti-epileptic drugs. Again, that means medications where the doses have been optimized, they're taken with regular compliance, they haven't been stopped due to side effects. And we're shifting that definition a little bit to really just include one medication in certain patients, specifically patients with what we consider having lesional epilepsy, and we'll get more to that later. So approximately one-third of patients with epilepsy have medically refractory epilepsy. And what's important to realize, again, is that once a patient has failed two drugs, the chances of seizure freedom on other anti-epileptic drugs is sort of diminishingly small at that point. Next slide. So epilepsy is fairly common. The incidence of new-onset seizures in children is about four out of 1,000. And as Dr. Monrad pointed out, the incidence over the course of a lifetime is much higher than that. Over the course of two years, eight to 10% of these children with new-onset seizures will go on to develop medically refractory epilepsy. And even for children who initially have good control of their seizures on medications, there's still about an 8% chance that the seizures will become medically refractory at some point. Next slide. So a lot of this data comes from 
a pretty large study done by Quan and Brody. Um, this was originally published in 2000. And they did a prospective study looking at 525 patients. This was pediatrics and adults. They were aged 9 to 93 years old, uh, all with a diagnosis of epilepsy. So of these patients, 63%, or approximately two-thirds, were seizure-free on medications alone, which left that one-third with medically refractory epilepsy. And doing further subgroup analysis, we know that the prevalence of medically refractory epilepsy is higher than that among patients, again, with lesional epilepsy, meaning an anatomic lesion visible on MRI thought to be the underlying cause of the seizures. So sometimes we do see patients that have something like an arachnoid cyst, another finding on the MRI that we do not think is related to the seizures. And that's sort of important to realize. It really is a lesion that we think is the, the cause that's provoking the seizures. Next slide, please. So further work by the same group published about two decades later followed almost 2,000 epilepsy patients, some of them for over three decades. And they found that about half were able to achieve seizure freedom on monotherapy, so just a single agent. Another 11.5% became seizure-free with the addition of a second AED, so that brings us to about our two-thirds percent. And adding a third AED led to seizure freedom in an additional 4% of patients or so. And beyond that, overall, only about 2% of patients more reached seizure freedom with further drug trials. So the take-home, again, is that if, if your child doesn't reach seizure freedom on two to three AEDs, the chances of seizure freedom with subsequent drug trials is incredibly small. And really, you know, our threshold in the pediatric population as opposed to the adult population is different because we're also talking about brain development during this time where they're not achieving seizure freedom as opposed to, you know, in adults it feels like maybe you have a little bit longer, six months in the course of a 40-year-old's life is very different than six months in the course of a two-year-old's life. Next slide, please. So what I want to highlight, again, is that it's not just the seizures. It's the morbidity and even the mortality that comes with uncontrolled epilepsy. So there's significant morbidity in terms of quality of life, recurrent hospitalizations, inability to drive, often inability to attend regular school or hold a job later in life. And there's also an actual mortality risk for patients with uncontrolled epilepsy. So the risk of SUDEP, which stands for Sudden Unexplained Death in Epilepsy, is 0.5% per year. And there's almost a 1% per year SUDEP risk in patients with medically refractory epilepsy who are considered surgical candidates. So there's a lot that we can do as physicians to help. Next slide, please. Surgery can be incredibly effective. Of patients who are deemed appropriate surgical candidates, 60 to 80% of them will actually be seizure-free following epilepsy surgery. Now, some of them will need to continue their AEDs, but we're talking about kids who are having seizures, and sometimes these are daily seizures or even multiple a day, despite usually being on multiple medications prior to surgery. And yet there's a huge delay from the time of diagnosis of medically refractory epilepsy to surgical intervention. Next slide, please. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> so before we get to what we do in terms of surgical intervention, I want to take another minute to focus on the why and why we do it with some urgency, or why do we advocate for early surgical intervention. So regardless of the underlying etiology, for a patient with medically refractory epilepsy, early surgical intervention we think is key. We know that intractable seizures during the first 24 months of life are a significant risk factor for developmental delays, the brain is growing and developing so quickly at this stage that anything, such as ongoing seizures, that impairs cognitive development can have profound long-term effects. Inadequately controlled seizures can result in impairments in cognition, language, social skills, communication. Suboptimal seizures result in poor psychosocial outcomes with lower rates of high school completion, employment, marriage, and really overall socioeconomic productivity. And then again, not to mention the mortality risk that I, that I brought up before. So children with refractory epilepsy have an overall mortality risk of 0.5% per year, and that accumulates over a patient's lifetime. So as a surgeon, I tend to get really passionate about this, <laughs> um, seeing kids with sort of what was traditionally thought of as a medical disease, 
who I know I can offer surgical intervention that will have a huge impact in terms of neurocognitive development, quality of life, and overall mortality. Next slide, please. So again, there, there is a lot of room for improvement, and I think um, we're getting better, but we're not there yet. <laughs> so looking at the blue bar graph on the left, almost half of pediatric epilepsy surgery patients started seizing during their first year of life. And yet looking at the yellow graph on the right, we can see that most of them continue to seize for over a decade prior to surgical intervention. So the reasons for that delay are multifactorial. They're related to practice patterns, referrals, access to comprehensive epilepsy centers, sometimes a delay in the diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, and I'm happy to chat more about that later, but for now I'm gonna focus on the kids who do get referred for surgical evaluation. Next slide, please. So backing up a minute, we defined epilepsy as recurrent, unprovoked seizures, and the basic definition of a seizure as a sudden, uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain. But what causes that electrical disturbance? So epilepsy can be caused by a myriad of ideologies, some with imaging correlates and others that we refer to as idiopathic, which is to say, we don't always know. <laughs> Uh, on this slide, I have examples of things that can cause seizures that do show up on MRI or CT scans or that usually show up, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking through kind of some of the more common ones that we encounter. Next slide, please. So focal cortical dysplasia, or FCD, reflects an abnormality of development resulting in a defect in lamination. It can be divided into three main types with further subtyping, uh, and these are things that, you know, I read on the pathology report. <laughs> Um, but type 1 refers to isolated focal cortical dysplasia with abnormalities seen only in the lamination. Type 2 is similar, except you also have dysmorphic neurons or balloon cells. And type 3 focal cortical dysplasia refers to focal cortical dysplasia that's also associated with another lesion, such as a tumor, hippocampal sclerosis, a vascular abnormality, or even an area of remote trauma. Vocal cortical dysplasia is most often found in the frontal and temporal lobes, uh, though larger lesions may involve entire lobes or even an entire hemisphere. And interestingly, while uh, in this example you can see it, it often does show up on MRI scans, radiographic abnormalities may be subtle or undetectable, and EEG may be non-localized in up to 23 to 50% of these cases. And, and there are cases where FCD is actually only diagnosed on post-operative pathology. So we've, you know, able to localize the seizures to this specific area. We take out what we consider the offending brain. We always send it to the pathologist and it comes back, oh, there was focal cortical dysplasia there. Makes sense retrospectively. PET scans are slightly more sensitive in picking up on areas of abnormality or hypometabolism, uh, with PETs being positive in 75 to 90 percent of cases of focal cortical dysplasia. And I'd like to think that as we have, as we have better and better or higher resolution imaging, uh, we're now able to see su certain subtle abnormalities that we weren't able to pick up on before. So certainly, there are definitely things that we can see on our three Tesla MRI scanner that don't show up on the 1.5 Tesla scanner. Um, and I'd like to think that as our technology is getting better and better in the future, we may look back and say, oh, we can see this lesion now, you know, that 10, 15 years ago we weren't able to see. Next slide. So on this slide, I have examples of underlying tumors. Um, and in fact, we know that certain low-grade tumors, such as DNATs and gangliogliomas, are known to be associated with epilepsy. Uh, and sometimes also with cortical dysplasia. And that's sort of, you know, Dr. Monroe talked about when you have a tumor, really doing a little bit of a, a bigger workup before just taking the tumor out so that you make sure you're treating not just the tumor but also the epilepsy. Is it coming from kind of the surrounding area that's been made abnormal? Uh, we also know that these are, are lesions that actually have great cure rates, both in terms of the lesion itself, and the epilepsy with resection, um, some of the highest seizure remission rates following complete resection. Next slide. So remote trauma, which results in gliosis or scarring, can lead to seizures, and this can sometimes be in a very delayed fashion, even years later. This can be trauma from a traumatic brain injury, an infection, a perinatal infarct, as can be seen in the top image here. <clears throat> 
And then certain types of encephalitis, such as Rasmussen's encephalitis as an extreme example, as seen in the bottom image, are also associated with epilepsy. Rasmussen's encephalitis is an autoimmune disease with progressive involvement of one entire hemisphere. It eventually leads to hemiparesis and intractable seizures. Steroids and immunoglobulins, as well as plasmapheresis, provide sort of temporary relief, but hemispherectomy is actually the only known cure. Next slide. Here I have some examples of genetic abnormalities, such as tuberous sclerosis, which is seen in the top image, and Sturge Weber, which can be seen in the bottom images here, that are also known to be associated with epilepsy. So children with tuberous sclerosis often have multiple tubers throughout their brain, and only one or two of them may be epileptogenic, although other tubers may start to kind of act up throughout the child's lifetime. Uh, newer technologies, such as stereo EEG, which Dr. Monrad mentioned, and I'll talk more about a little bit later, has been incredibly helpful in pinpointing the quote-unquote hot tuber and then guiding a targeted resection. Sturge Weber, which is a unilateral neurocutaneous syndrome, most often diagnosed by the characteristic facial port wine stain, uh, can cause seizures in children that have brain involvement. So in children with brain involvement, there are leptomeningeal angiomas. These may involve the entire hemisphere, although they often do spare the frontal lobe and result in sort of widespread or multifocal seizure onset. Next slide, please. Hypothalamic hamartomas, which usually arise from the tubercinarium, which sits deep inside the brain between the mammillary bodies and the optic chiasm, are associated with very characteristic laughing spells or galastic seizures. Uh, they can also be associated with, with central precocious puberty and cognitive or behavioral problems. And again, we'll talk more about these later, but this is another area where advancements in the field, new technology, minimally invasive techniques have dramatically changed how we treat hypothalamic hematomas and their associated seizures. And then other developmental abnormalities, such as hemimegalencephaly, seen in the image on the left, where one hemisphere is hypertrophied and contains abnormal and dysplastic gleoneuronal proliferation, or polymicrogyria, seen in the image on the right, where there are multiple small and abnormally formed gyri, are also known to be associated sometimes with catastrophic early onset epilepsy. So hemimegalencephaly, as is apparent from the name itself, generally always involves one entire hemisphere, with the best chance for seizure freedom and neurodevelopment being an early hemispherectomy. Polymicrogyria can be focal or more widespread, um, and operative intervention, therefore, is tailored to the particular presentation. But both of these developmental abnormalities occur prior to birth, and so especially in more severe cases, these children may have medically refractory epilepsy essentially from the time they are born. Next slide, please. So with some of these developmental abnormalities, uh, as I mentioned, they may start at birth or shortly thereafter, but often the seizure is the first sign which leads to a diagnosis of some sort of underlying lesion, right? We get the MRI after the, the first seizure has happened. Um, and while I'm going to talk today about advancements in the field and all the amazing things we can do, I also find it very humbling to sort of recognize how little we still know and understand about the brain. So in many cases, a low-grade tumor may have been there for years prior to seizure onset. Or if you take two kids with tuberous sclerosis, one has uncontrollable epilepsy and the others never had a seizure in their life. And so what is it that ultimately triggers that electrical disturbance? or perhaps why and when it occurs, I think we're still trying to figure out the answer to that question. Next slide, please. So I'll leave it to people much smarter than myself to answer that question, because regardless of the cause, any patient with medically refractory epilepsy should be referred for surgical evaluation. And this gets back to that whole team that I talked about before. So patients that are referred to Seattle Children's Hospital initially get a pre-surgical evaluation, uh, and Dr. Monrad sort of started talking about this workup, and I'll go into a little bit more detail. So this consists of an interdisciplinary group, again, consisting of epileptologists, neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, geneticists, neuropsychologists, uh, and patients initially undergo a non-invasive workup. So that consists of their video EEG, various imaging modalities, including structural MRIs as well as functional MRIs. We get an interictal PET scan. They have a comprehensive neuropsych evaluation. And all of this is to figure out not only where the seizures are coming from, but also how their brain is both wired and affected by those seizures. Next slide, please. 
So let's come back to patient DF. In DF's case, we already knew that he had an underlying injury to his brain from his previous tumor, the surgeries, the chemo, the radiation. Can I tell you why he had a period of two years of seizure freedom? No. But what I can tell you is that once the seizures started, they really didn't give up. By the spring of 2021, he was maxed out on two different medications, had failed three others, and not only was he having at least daily seizures, but his parents felt that either the seizures or the medications or maybe a combination of both were causing him to be more irritable with a decreased attention span and a shorter fuse for just becoming incredibly upset. So his non-invasive workup essentially revealed diffuse right-sided abnormalities. And you can see you can see that both in the structural MRI that the right side of the brain looks very different, as well as in the uh, PET scan here, which shows, again, kind of more normal glucose uptake on the healthy or left side of the brain and comparatively very low glucose uptake on the right side of the brain. So uh, this was, again, it was consistent across all of his scans. And then furthermore, the functional MRI actually showed decreased activation of normal motor networks on the right side. So these uh, functional renderings are not flipped. <laughs> it's a little bit confusing, I know, but this is actually the left side in this case, and this is the right side. And you can see motor activation on the left side, and we see no appreciable motor activation on the right side there. And that sort of suggested an early developmental injury to his brain, right? Likely related to everything he had gone through at less than two years of age and subsequent rewiring. His EEG showed near continuous right parietal and occipital interictal discharges with diffuse right-sided slowing and multifocal right-sided seizure onset. Next slide, please. So in DF's case, the imaging, the EEG, and the rest of the non-invasive workup was enough to localize the seizures. However, sometimes when the data is not as clear cut or doesn't all correspond, we do recommend surgical workup for seizure localization. And we tend to call this phase two. Next slide. So traditionally, phase two consisted of subdural strips and grids, as can be seen in this picture here, uh, which allows us to record seizure activity directly from the surface, the cortical surface of the brain. This does necessitate a large open craniotomy with some degree of surgical morbidity. Um, and today, we typically reserve grids for cases where we also need to map function, such as language function or motor function, as we believe that the seizures are either coming from or right near what we consider eloquent cortex. Mapping a function can be done directly in the operating room via an awake craniotomy, uh, but many children are too young to tolerate an awake craniotomy or too developmentally delayed, uh, or we need to first both localize seizure onset zone as well as brain function. So once the grids are placed, children are watched in the epilepsy monitoring unit, usually for about a week, and that gives us time to both gather enough seizure data as well as to do the brain mapping. Brain mapping involves various tasks dependent on the function that we're trying to localize with current then passed through the grid. If the current leads to an arrest in function, we know that we have localized either a key language or a key motor area. Next slide, please. So while we still use grids in certain cases, over the last decade or so, we've largely transitioned to what we consider minimally invasive stereo EEG monitoring. And stereo EEG electrodes are basically thin wire electrodes that get placed stereotactically with the help of a robotic surgical arm. Trajectories are planned based on presumed areas of seizure onset with care taken to avoid cortical vessels, minimize local transgressions, and the robotic surgical arm allows for very precise placement of the electrodes through tiny incisions that are truly only a few millimeters. Once the electrodes are placed, 3D renderings can help to confirm exactly where each contact is located, which is key in terms of data interpretation. As Dr. Monrad showed, we get you know, extensive data from these electrodes. Each electrode has anywhere from 6 to 12 contacts, and we usually place anywhere from about 8 to 20 electrodes per patient, depending on uh, our pre-implantation hypothesis. This allows for monitoring throughout the brain, so we're actually able to cover kind of a broader region than we would with traditional grids. Um, it's associated with very low surgical risk. And again, once we've captured enough seizure data, 
These can be removed incredibly easily. Some patients actually go home later that same day, if not the following day. So importantly, phase two monitoring, whether via strips and grids or via stereo EEG, has to be hypothesis driven. So it's often done to confirm or better pinpoint seizure onset, sometimes done to exclude a secondary seizure focus or to better define sort of the extent of abnormality. Next slide, please. In cases where the seizure onset zone can be localized, we offer resective surgery. Now, resection does not necessarily mean big open surgery. Uh, it can be done with minimally invasive tools such as laser ablation, but especially in kids, there's still a significant percentage of what we do that does involve larger open resections uh, where we take out an, an underlying area of abnormality. Sometimes that area is as large as an entire lobe or even an entire hemisphere um, where we can actually disconnect kind of the bad side of the brain from the good. And in cases where there are multiple foci or occasionally where the focus of, is an area of the brain where we think that to remove it would cause unacceptable morbidity, we can offer neuromodulation to decrease seizure burden. So this was traditionally done in the form of a vagal nerve stimulator. Uh, but it's increasingly come to include things like deep brain stimulation and responsive neurostimulation, which can either target one or two known foci or work in more of a generalized way by placing leads deep within the center of the brain in the thalamic nuclei. So the pie chart at the top of this slide shows practice patterns from 2008. Uh, I would say this is now shifting more towards minimally invasive and neuromodulatory approaches, but Really, almost 50% of the surgeries that we do for pediatric epilepsy are low bar resections. And I think that this sort of represents both the widespread nature of the disease, uh, as well as maybe our inability to more focally pinpoint you know, exactly where the seizures are coming from or exactly how to disrupt that network effectively. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to bore you with all of the details of the surgical approach. Uh, Admittedly, this is where I get excited, um, but I do want to talk a little bit about our different surgical options. So importantly, again, what we recommend is really patient-specific, and that it's based on not only the underlying pathology, but really the phase one and often phase two workups. Next slide. Uh, I think we're there. Thank you. <laughs> so for a patient with a low-grade tumor, which can be seen uh, here... Um, this is often, again, associated with surrounding cortical dysplasia. We can offer what we consider a lesionectomy or a lobectomy, depending on the surrounding extent of abnormality, as well as where we're operating in terms of eloquent cortex in the brain. We also do intraoperative brain recording, something called ECOG, where during surgery we actually place uh, EEG strips right along the cortex of the brain and can record uh, seizure activity we certainly don't expect the patient to be seizing during surgery, but you can see abnormalities when you're sort of that close to the focus, uh, even during kind of normal periods. And that helps us determine the extent of our, our resection. Next slide. I wanna include another patient example. Um, this one actually occurred as I was putting this talk together. This is a two and a half year old girl who had been diagnosed with epilepsy consisting of simple partial motor seizures at six weeks of age. In retrospect, mom thinks that she had probably had these seizures since birth. You know, again, sometimes it's very difficult to tell. They'd been intermittently under better control for the better part of two years with periodic exacerbations. Um, but in the two weeks before I met her, she was hospitalized at an outside hospital with over 100 seizures per day. Mom said at 117, she stopped counting. 117 seizures in a two and a half year old little girl every single day. She was on five different anti-epileptic medications and nothing seemed to be helping. And per the parents, you could tell that her brain and her entire body were just exhausted. So on imaging, there was an area of right frontal cortical dysplasia. And this corresponded to her seizure onset zone, both based on scalp EEG and seizure semiology. And while the area of abnormality was well in front of primary motor cortex, it was wrecking havoc in her brain, right? These seizures were spreading and causing these focal motor seizures. 
So we took her to the OR for a partial right frontal lobectomy, and the most amazing thing was talking to her parents the morning after surgery. It was the first night in as long as they could remember that she had not had a single seizure, and they could tell that their little girl was back. Next slide. So this is an example of a very different patient, a 17-year-old who had epilepsy, an epilepsy-causing tumor. Um, it's subtle, but you can see it right there. Uh, and it was located right in front of primary motor cortex. So we had offered surgical resection some years ago, uh, but there is some risk of post-operative weakness, even if temporary. Her seizures were about once a month. She didn't find them too debilitating and wasn't interested in pursuing an open surgery. Uh, but as our field changed and advanced, we were then able to offer her a laser ablation for that same lesion. And so after lengthy discussions with the patient and her family, they elected to undergo laser ablation. And so you can see again the tumor here on the left and then through a tiny incision, truly about the size of my pinky nail, using stereotactic guidance and that robotic arm, we first biopsied the tumor and then inserted a laser probe into the center of the lesion. And the middle image here, where you can see the orange, this is a real-time heat map as we ablate the tissue, showing the effects on the tumor with sparing of the surrounding brain. The image on the right is immediately post-ablation, so you can see again here, there's focal necrosis of the tumor tissue itself without any injury to the surrounding brain. She woke up neurologically intact, without any haircut, and was discharged home the following day. Next slide, please. So laser ablation is now also pretty much the mainstay treatment for hypothalamic hamartomas, which I had mentioned earlier. The hypothalamus sits deep within the brain, uh, and traditionally, these lesions were treated with open surgical resection. While it's technically feasible, as one can see based on the location highlighted in these images here, it's a long reach to get to the hypothalamus, necessitating traversing and or retraction of quite a lot of normal brain. Following surgery, it was not uncommon for patients to have post-operative hospitalizations of a week or more. So now we're actually able to treat hypothalamic hematomas with laser ablation. Again, a tiny incision's made, one or two lasers are placed. Uh, you can make out the laser trajectory, sort of that line you're seeing here on this image. Uh, and we're able to ablate the tumor, you know, in usually the ablation itself takes less than an hour once everything's in place. And most patients are discharged home the following day with significantly less surgical morbidity compared to an open resection. Next slide, please. So of course, disease is not always that focal. Getting back to our friend DF, given the widespread area of injury, the recommendation was for a right-sided functional hemispherectomy, essentially disconnecting the two hemispheres, sparing the deeper structures. Hemispherectomies are indicated in cases of catastrophic hemispheric epilepsy. These include cases of Rasmussen's encephalitis, holohemispheric cortical dysplasia, hemimegalencephaly, sometimes in Sturge-Weber, or in cases of hemispheric migrational abnormalities. And traditionally, these were done uh, what we call anatomically, meaning that, quote unquote, all of the bad brain tissue was removed. This, however, led to high rates of superficial hemosiderosis as a long-term complication, as well as high rates of post-operative hydrocephalus necessitating shunting. So now we do what we call a functional hemispherectomy. And we still remove some of the tissue, but the goal is really to disconnect the white matter tracts that connect the seizing part of the brain from the deep structures and the other side. And hemispherectomy is done for the correct indications result in an 80 to 90% rate of seizure freedom. So I'd say it's probably one of the largest surgeries that we still do, one of the most sort of dramatic surgeries that we do. And I have yet to meet a family that wasn't nervous going into it, and afterwards didn't say, why didn't we do this sooner? Uh, functional hemispherectomies also now result in only about a 15 to 20% risk of developing hydrocephalus postoperatively. Next slide, please. So in DF's case, postoperatively, he's remained seizure-free. His parents feel like he's making up for lost time in terms of his cognitive development. Uh, and his behavioral problems are also greatly improved. So he's got a longer attention span, less overall irritability, 
In fact, when he was still in the hospital, there was one day where he was playing a card game and we walked into the room and, and dad just looked at us and said, I can't believe he has the, the patience to do this, right? He hadn't been able to do that in, in well over a year. Next slide. So what about the patients who have multiple seizure foci, who can't be localized? I think in some ways these are sort of the most exciting patients because it's an area of surgical epilepsy that's at the forefront both of what we do and our understanding of the brain and seizure activity. Traditionally, as I mentioned previously, neuromodulation came in the form of VNS or vagal nerve stimulation. A VNS device consists of small coils wrapped around the vagus nerve and it's implanted in the neck. These are then attached to a generator that sits in the chest kind of like a pacemaker functions by three mechanisms. The first way it works is just sort of sending a baseline rate of current. And the thought is that it overall dampens brain excitability and therefore seizure activity. The newer generations of the VNS also now have the ability to detect the heart rate. So we know that many seizures are associated with a sudden tachycardia. And so when the VNS device detects a sudden increase in heart rate, it sends an extra stimulation with the idea being to stop a seizure in its tracks or before it kind of becomes a clinical seizure. And then the third way it works is the parents or the patients are given a magnet. And if the patient either gets an aura pre-seizure or has prolonged seizures, they can swipe the magnet over the device at the start of a seizure, again, with the idea being to kind of abort it before it uh, really takes off. So something like VNS has less than a 5% chance of achieving seizure freedom, but the vast majority of patients do have a noticeable benefit, with all patients also having a decreased risk of SUDEP following placement. And many patients, again, are, are sort of out of other options. And so if you can take a patient who's seizing multiple times a day and get them down to seizing once a week, that's a huge difference even if you haven't reached seizure freedom. So in terms of statistics, the easy way to think about it is that 50% of patients achieve 50% or more seizure reduction. Uh, more detailed is about a third, a third, a third. So we say a third of patients experience up to about a 90% decrease in their seizure burden. A third are more at, right at that 50% range. And a third experience really minimal or no benefit, although they do all still experience that decreased rate of SUDEP. Unfortunately, we don't yet have a great way to predict which bucket each patient will fall into, and I think that's, you know, again, getting to where the field is going as we understand more about the brain, different type of, types of epilepsy, different genetics. What's important to realize uh, about all of the neuromodulation I'm going to talk about is compared to medications, what's really nice is that when there is a benefit, it's sustained. So often with medications, we'll see kind of a honeymoon period a kid starts a new medication, seems like it's the magic bullet, it works beautifully, and then a few months later, the seizures kind of get back to where they had been. The opposite is true with neuromodulation. So not only do the effects not wear off over time, but in fact, you can actually see increased efficacy over time, especially with some of the newer devices. Uh, next slide, please. So more and more, we're starting to implant neuromodulation devices directly into the brain itself. The RNS device was made so you can place electrodes directly over two different seizure foci. This was originally designed for adult patients with bi bilateral mesial temporal sclerosis or for seizure foci in eloquent cortex. And through a closed loop system, the device actually learns to recognize the start of seizure activity in the brain. So it recognizes that abnormal activity which then triggers it to fire, with the idea being to stop the seizure before it becomes a clinical seizure. RNS and DBS can be used in a similar way that DBS has been used now for decades in Parkinson's disease, with electrodes implanted into the thalamic nuclei, although we have slightly different targets than with Parkinson's disease. Um, and this kind of works, again, to modulate overall activity, similar to the VNS, but arguably closer to the start of seizure onset. Uh, the RNS works in a similar fashion with the addition that is actually able to recognize seizure activity, and you can see thalamic spikes even in what are considered to be cortically-based seizures. So one of the largest trials to date looking at the efficacy of thalamic stimulation, which in this case was done with the deep brain 
uh, stimulation to the anterior thalamic nuclei for the treatment of epilepsy is the SANTE trial. And this study was done in adults, um, but we're able to extrapolate a lot of the data onto our pediatric population. Things, you know, sort of as always, our first FDA approved in the adult population slowly rolled out um, into the pediatric population. Europe tends to be a little bit ahead of us in allowing pediatric approval, and so some of this stuff is admittedly done kind of off-label initially, but we do have, uh, we're, we're kind of accumulating more and more data. So this initial trial involved 110 participants who were randomized into treatment and non-treatment groups. They were all implanted, but not all turned on. The initial study followed these patients for two years and showed almost a 30% greater reduction in seizures in the stimulation group, with 54% of patients having at least that 50% reduction in their seizure burden, so similar to the results that we see with BNS. Interestingly, though, there were actually 14 patients who were reported to be completely seizure-free for at least six months at the conclusion of the trial. And then a 10-year follow-up study, which was just published last year, showed improved results over time. So there was actually a 75% median seizure frequency reduction at seven years post-device implantation. There were no unanticipated serious adverse events and that similar decreased risk in SUDEP. So again, this is sort of where I get excited. Um, one of the things that, that I find most intellectually exciting about the field, um, because I think we're just expanding our ability to help patients, but also our understanding of seizure activity. Especially from the RNS device, we have access to ongoing seizure monitoring, really long term. And, and the more we know, the better job we can do in terms of designing, developing, implanting better and better surgical interventions. Next slide. So coming to the last part of my talk, while well, one third of patients with epilepsy have medically refractory epilepsy, a majority of these children have surgically curable epilepsy. Again, with 60 to 80% of children with medically refractory epilepsy becoming seizure free after appropriate surgical intervention. And a lot of that range is really, again, dependent on the underlying pathology, the underlying etiology. Some of the best results we see are for patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, especially those associated with an underlying lesion. And actually about 30 to 50% of these patients can get fully off of their AEDs. And that's really important for a lot of kids. Um, a lot of kids do report not only do the seizures result in impairments in cognition and brain development, uh, but I've had many kids say, you know, older kids are kind of able to articulate a feeling of, of brain fog associated with some of the medications, right? We know we're sort of dampening brain activity that can't not affect normal activity. So again, unlike with medications, if one has a benefit following surgery, it does tend to last. So we said, even with upfront medical control of seizures, many children go on to develop medically refractory epilepsy over time, and the opposite really is true of for surgery. So we tend not to report patient outcomes until a full year out, uh, but we know that if a patient does not have any seizures during the first six months following surgery, they actually have up to a 95% chance of being completely seizure-free long-term. And again, even without complete seizure freedom, surgery can lead to improvements in terms of developmental quotients, behavior, attention and IQ scores, improvements in school performance and social adaptation. Quality of life improves and may even normalize. Studies have looked at greater reported feelings of self-worth and social competence. And some of these quality of life improvements have actually been shown to occur within six months following surgery. So a study done in 2006 showed that in children that undergo temporal lobectomy, quality of life indices normalized to that of matched healthy individuals after three years. By comparison, intractable temporal lobe epilepsy treated without surgical therapy is known to be associated with low quality of life scores, despite attempts at optimizing AADs. And overall, surgery for epilepsy has been shown to be incredibly cost effective, both in terms of keeping patients out of the hospital with seizure exacerbations, allowing them to finish school, keep a job, and also in terms of their caregivers being able to work and do other things than take care of the child with uncontrolled epilepsy. Next slide, please. So because no surgical talk is complete without a discussion of complications, surgical mortality is less than 0.2 to 2% for the larger procedures we do, such as temporal lobectomy or hemispherectomy. 
and permanent surgical morbidity is, is really reported to be less than 5%. In terms of morbidity, temporal lobe seizures, or excuse me, temporal resections are most often complicated by visual field deficits, while extratemporal resections are most often complicated by transient hemiparesis. Infrequently, infarcts or permanent hemiparesis and language deficits may occur. But really importantly, the risks of surgery are less than the risks associated with the natural history of treatment-resistant epilepsy. I'll get to my last slide. Uh, so just to conclude, medically refractory epilepsy is common. It's caused by a diverse group of etiologies. There is a myriad of surgical options and approaches with cutting-edge technology, and I really do feel like we're learning more and more every day. In terms of outcomes, patients deem surgical candidates approximately 60 to 80% of them achieve seizure freedom following epilepsy surgery. Complication rates are low, and really, and I think most importantly, the outcomes in terms of seizures, psychosocial, developmental, and even economic really speak for themselves. Thank you.